years ago when I was <clears throat> evangelizing and uh, really struggling to, to be effective in ministry, I remember going to a uh, pastor's conference or retreat, and uh, there was a couple of ministers there that really spoke a rhema word, and uh, those couple of days that I was in that conference, I think they had something in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening, and of course they had a dinner for fellowship, but I remember um, having such a connection with the Lord and God really speaking to my spirit and encouraging me. That is really our vision for Regeneration Nations. Um, because most churches aren't this size. Most churches maybe have 50, 100, 150 people. And you will never know how difficult it is for pastors who pastor smaller churches to try to stay encouraged and and uh, and to have a rhema of word of the Lord. And so our, our vision is to pour into these men and women that they can come somewhere, get hands laid on them. How many like you have hands laid on you? My wife always tells me, said, if you would just stick them in a line, you don't even have to prophesy to them. Just put your hand on them and pray for them. And she said that, that would be enough. And so, uh, I don't know, maybe one of these days we'll just um, tell you if you want to stay and get hands laid on you, make a line, fall out the door, and uh, we'll lay hands on every one of you because there is a power. There's power to impartation. This is why the Bible says that to, to lay hands on no man suddenly. You got to be careful who you lay, lay hands on you. And, uh, and I always tell people, don't take it personal, but, you know, a lot of times in conferences and even in church, I'll have somebody come up that's really been touched by the ministry They'll say, can I just lay hands on you and pray for you? And I say, no. You know why? Because spirits get imparted. By laying on of hands. Remember what Paul told Timothy? He said, stir up the gift that you received in prophecy by the laying on of hands. So you need to be careful who you let lay hands on you. And uh, so we want to encourage these men and women in the body of Christ. Well, I, I didn't bring my Bible up, but I did bring some notes. So that means I'm going to preach to you. How many is going to get with me? Hallelujah. In fact, why don't we just stand up for a moment? Let's just begin to loose our worship in this building. God, we thank you. I want you to break every stronghold. I, I feel like the enemy's coming against us today. I want you to loose your praise. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you speak in tongues, speak in tongues. Let's chase every demon out of this building in the name of the Lord. Those of you that are watching online, begin to join with me in the power of prayer. Now, Lord, we declare an open heaven over this building. Hallelujah. That, Lord, no weapon formed against this service shall prosper. We come against you, devil, in the name of Jesus hallelujah and we declare that there is liberty in the house in the name of the Lord hallelujah 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 God I thank you for your word today I thank you for the power of God we thank you Lord for the authority of the Holy Ghost praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord um, I know last time I asked if they were here and, and something happened and they couldn't be here. Is, is Dan and Vicki Aarons here today? All right, well, come down here, is, is both of you. I want to lay hands on you. I've just felt a stirring in my spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to tell you what, God cares about each and every one of you in this building. And those of you that are watching online, you are valuable to the kingdom of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just come right up here on the platform. Amen. This is, uh, these are two godly people that are part of this church, and uh, they're faithful, they're givers, and, but more than that, they have a heart for the Lord. And um, I, I just, uh, we're going to lay hands on you and loose, I, I sense, I know this by the, by the natural, some of the things we've texted about, but I feel like God has said, I've had enough of this. And uh, we want to reverse, hallelujah, in the name of the Lord, everything that the enemy says has been settled that's against you. I bind it in the name of the Lord. And now in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, 
And the enemy, the Lord says the enemy is trying to wear you down. That's what I hear in the spirit. The Lord, the Lord says the enemy is trying to weigh, wear you down and make you to agree to something that would be partial victory. The Lord says, hold your ground because I am not a God of partial victory. And, and the virtue that's been, been pulled out of you, I replenish in the name of the Lord. And now in the name of the Lord, God says, I'm going to begin to give you some divine understanding, some divine strategies in the name of Jesus. And what the enemy has stolen from you, God, we demand that he has to give back. Not what he stole, but that with interest seven times. That, oh, hallelujah, God, that, Lord, you will begin to open up new avenues. God, new avenues of resource. For I've raised you up, says the Lord, for such a time as this. And I am not done, but I'm getting ready to open the windows of heaven because of your faith and because you are a steward and a giver. I'm going to make you a channel, both of you, says God, that much abundance is going to begin to flow through you into the kingdom of God. And I'm going to make those that have stood and said, we won. I'm going to make them bow down in defeat by the power of God. So now out of your belly, hallelujah, I loose the divine unction of the Lord, that the power of God would hit you from your head to your feet. And from this day on, hallelujah, that you will begin to see reversal by the power of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when Jesus came into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body has you prepared for me. We know up into the time of Jesus that the sacrifices that came to God the Father were animals. You know, I, I would have to think that... Um, when the enemy's finally defeated and time is no more, the, some of the life form that has to be the most excited about it has to be animals. Uh, I'm a huge animal lover. And when I read in portions of the scripture, it'll say, and they offer sacrifices unto the Lord and they sacrifice 72 bulls and 48 lambs and 38 goats and 28 pigeons. And I'm thinking, um, you know, it seemed like the only ones that really sacrificed there were the animals. <laughs> now, I understand the principle, but there is coming a day In fact, we're in it right now to where, aren't you glad that for us to have a move of God, we don't have to have a bloody spectacle of animals being slain so we can make it another year? And finally, one day, the fathers just, he had enough. He said, no more sacrifices. And when Jesus came into the earth, he says, you have prepared me a body because no longer do you delight in sacrifices of bulls and goats. So when God came to the earth, in order to be on the level of man, he had to become a man. Because for you and I to become like God, God first had to become like us. And the Bible says this, as Jesus is right now, so are we in this world. Why? Because of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The last thing that the devil wanted was a physical presence of God in the earth. Because it would threaten his ownership of the earth. 
And from the moment that Jesus was born, hell tried to kill him. Because there was a manifested physical presence of God himself in the earth. And for the first time, there had to be tremors in the spirit realm that demons were feeling even before Jesus ever turned 30 and was anointed by the Holy Ghost there had to be an unsettling in the atmosphere when this teenage boy would just walk around when he'd walk into his daddy's carpenter shop and help build a stool or a table. When he sat in the temple at the age of 12 and he began to speak. There was something that began to come out of this physical presence of God that shook hell up. And they tried to kill him. Why? Because they did not want the body of Christ in the earth for this reason. Colossians 2 9 says this for in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and when Jesus began to walk in the earth now the scripture says about Jesus that God was manifested in the flesh we know that, that that was Christ. John, the first chapter, said that he became flesh. Jesus became flesh. But it says of the other two parts of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost and the Father, it said they dwelled in Christ. So here you have the Word walking around in the earth named Jesus. But in him, hallelujah, is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in the bodily form of Jesus. No wonder he could look at leprosy and command it to be healed. Because when he spoke, it was the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost coming together in unity. And what happened at creation was carried over through the physical form of Jesus. Why? Because the body of Jesus the body of God was in the earth and in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead so now I'm going to take you on a journey here I'm going to have to lay you some foundation but in, in Genesis second chapter in verse 18 it says of the first Adam you remember in the scriptures now it says that the first Adam that had the wife Eve, he's the first Adam, and then in the New Testament it says that Jesus is the last Adam. It didn't say he was a second, because that means there could have been a third, a fourth, a fifth. He was the last Adam. But when the Father created Adam, not man said this, but God said this. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a companion. So he took Adam and he caused him to go to sleep. And in the position of sleep, rest, out of Adam's side came his lifelong companion that he would walk with. And God wanted Adam to have a wife. It was not God's intention for Adam to accomplish the will of God without a wife. Acts 7 and 38 talks about this. It says of the Israelites that they were the church in the wilderness. The church didn't come in full existence on, at Pentecost 
Because the Bible said that the the wilderness housed the church. So God, even back then, looked at the believers and he called them the church. They were the church in the wilderness. It was the intention of God at Mount Sinai to marry Israel. And when you go back and you study, the Ten Commandments were part of the, the agreement between the husband and the wife, between God and Israel. And they were making a covenant with God. And when Israel went into idolatry with the golden calves, God divorced Israel and Moses broke the covenant that's why he broke the commandments because he was breaking the covenant of marriage between God and Israel I had somebody write me a letter I I just mind-boggling to me we know that that Israel is God's chosen people in the earth in the natural but we also always remember this Israel is going to have to come through the blood like everybody else. And anybody that ever tells you that God has a separate plan of salvation for the Jews outside the church is wrong. The church does not replace Israel. In eternity, Israel and the church are one. Somebody wrote me and said, we thank you for for teaching on the prophetic feasts and that the church needs to understand that the devil doesn't care how many Gentiles get saved. That doesn't bother him, but he trembles when Jews get saved. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm making the devil tremble. I ain't a Jew. I'm a Gentile. Now, we have Jews in this church. The Isaacs are Jews. But we're all grafted in, hallelujah, to the same olive tree. Just that the Jews were cut out of the natural olive tree and you and I were grafted in. We were grafted in by the power of the Holy Ghost. But in eternity, hallelujah, there is no segregation. There's not going to be a part for Israel and a part for for certain kinds of cultures and then the Pentecostals and the Baptists and the Methodists. No, sir. We're one body. One Lord, one faith, one baptism in this house, hallelujah. We don't care where you come from, what color you are, what language you speak. But if you've come through the blood, then you are part of the body of Jesus Christ. So the Father intended for Jesus to have a wife. He never intended for him to be alone. When Jesus was on the earth, there was no greater power in the earth than Jesus. Demons trembled without him even saying anything. You remember when the Bible said that in the temple there was a man that was demon-possessed. I'm wondering, how long had that guy been in that church demon-possessed? And he was comfortable there. But the Scripture says that Jesus showed up and walked into the church. And when he showed up, demons began to cry out. I can tell you this is going to be a hot place for, for demon spirits in this building. We believe in casting out demons by the power of the name of Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, he was the greatest authority that was ever known. In fact, he said this, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He was the ultimate authority. He had the ultimate power. There has never been anybody like him since. There will never be anybody to replace him. He is still king of kings and lord of lords. He has the highest name. That's why Hollywood doesn't say, oh, Buddha or old Muhammad they take the name of Jesus in vain why because when unbelievers say Jesus Christ they feel an authority when that name comes out of your mouth whether you're saved or not whether you do it in praise or cursing when you say the name of Jesus there is authority that comes out of that name and that's why the sinner says the name of Jesus
Because if they were men, they just said, oh, Buddha. <laughs> that don't do anything for them. They say GD, they feel a release. There's an authority that comes out of that. Why? Because at the name of Jesus, every knee has to bow and every tongue has to confess. So, when Jesus left the earth, he did not take his authority or his anointing with him. He left it in the earth. Why? Because demons were not gone. And Jesus was starting something. And for it to be effective, it was going to require anointing and authority by the Spirit of the Lord. Acts chapter, I think it's chapter 20, in verse 28, it says that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. When Jesus left the earth, he left his power, his authority, and his anointing to the church. Now, the modern church has the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. We know this, that the power of the Godhead is the Holy Ghost. So, this is why modern churches don't cast out demons. They don't believe in miracles. So a lot of churches say, because they can't walk in miracles, don't have authority. They say, well, the day of miracles is over. Tell that to the 82-year-old lady that got out of her wheelchair two weeks ago. Or a dentist that got healed by Parkinson's disease. If I asked how many of you have been healed by the power of God, most of this church would stand up. But whenever you believe in God, you can be in control. Muslims believe in God. The Buddhists believe in God. Jehovah Witnesses believe in God. Mormons believe in God. And you can believe in Jesus. The Baptists believe in Jesus. They're fundamentally strong on the deity of Jesus Christ. What most churches have a problem with is releasing the Holy Ghost. Have the form of God, but no power. If you don't have the Holy Ghost operating in your church or in your life, there are going to be seasons where the enemy is going to slap you up alongside the head and defeat you. But building yourself up on your most holy faith, doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. There are some times I don't need revelation. I just need the Holy Ghost. What is that? You are losing the authority and the power of the Holy Ghost in the atmosphere. So, The father expects Jesus to have a wife. When Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected at the feast of first fruits. And we know that between the feast of first fruits and the feast of Pentecost is 50 days. First fruits was the feast that celebrated the beginning of harvest. It was the initial harvest. The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruit of many brethren. So fulfilling the feast, he has to come up out of the ground at first fruits. So he comes out at resurrection in, in, in around April. Um, we celebrate Easter at that time. But he resurrects. For 40 days, the Bible says that Jesus 
doesn't go back to heaven, but he walks Galilee for 40 days, and he's talking to his disciples. He is instructing them. He's telling them things. What is going on? After 40 days, the Bible says that Jesus on the Mount of Olives begins to say bye, and he's lifted up out of their sight. And the angel says, don't be heavy-hearted, for the same Jesus that you have seen go away shall in like manner return. That means that Jesus is coming back back on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in half, and he's going to walk down through the eastern gate into Jerusalem, and he's going to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords for 1,000 years on this planet. That means, think about it, for 1,000 years, we still got God on the earth physically ruling and reigning with you and I in absolute victory. And there'll be no devil. We don't know what that's like. But the Bible says one angel will come down, and get a hold of the devil, bind him with a great chain, and for a thousand years there will be this great freedom. So he leaves after 40 days, but before he leaves in Luke, he tells, I think it's in Luke. He tells his disciples, he said, go to Jerusalem and tarry there till you be endued with power from on high. Now, you would think that these guys would have had an understanding of what was getting ready to happen because they were Jews and they they were familiar with the feasts. They kept them. They're 40 days from Feast of First Fruits They are 10 days from Pentecost or Jubilee. The Lord says, go tarry ye in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. They don't know what that means. All they know is he told us to go tarry because something's going to happen. On the 50th day, which was the day of Pentecost, Heaven opens, and God Almighty looses the Holy Ghost on the church. And on that day, God empowered the church with the nature of her husband. Hallelujah. And there was a marriage that took place in the Spirit. And the and Jesus and the church became husband and wife. Though Jesus was in heaven, the bride was down here. But in the spirit, they were joined together by the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that right now, you and I, when we go to heaven, we sit down next to Jesus Christ. We don't sit down next to the Father. We don't sit down next to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's in the earth. We sit next to Jesus. Why? Because we're sitting next to our husband. This is why there should be a special relationship between you and Christ. So Christ now, Jesus gives the church everything that he operated in when he was in the earth. This is why Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. I'm preaching this to you because you and I are going to have the privilege of beholding the last great outpouring of the Holy Ghost that man has never seen. This is great what we have today, but I'm telling you, it won't be long that if you don't get here early, the curtains are going to go up and every seat in this house is going to be filled because when you start having divine miracles take place in a building, then you step over into another dimension. That's why Benny Hinn could put 25,000 people in a building. That's why Catherine Kuhlman could do what she did. Why? Because when you begin to loose the divine nature of God in the atmosphere, all of a sudden it's better than the Super Bowl. It's better than the Grammys. Hallelujah. It's better than the latest movie that's come out. It's better than a house, a car. Because when you get in the atmosphere of your husband, hallelujah, and between God 
in Christ, there is a release to the church of the glory of the Lord. People begin to get healed and delivered in the atmosphere, even without the laying on of hands. Even right now, hallelujah, there is such a possibility of the Spirit of the Lord reaching into your life right now, reaching into your body, reaching into the atmosphere of where you reign. My God, I loose, hallelujah, on you right now, a, a release of the favor and of the glory of God. The church belonged to the Father. Jesus was a Jew. He fulfilled the cultural requirements. He came to the Father and said, I want to marry the church. And the Father says, you got to pay a dowry. And Jesus says, what is it? He said, I want your blood. And Jesus, hallelujah, went down to the earth allowed himself to be crucified that his blood began to flow. Remember the first Adam, when he became one with Eve, it was a God thing and he's asleep. When the last Adam got ready to marry his wife, he was asleep in the grave for three days and out of his side, hallelujah, he was pierced. And the church, just as the first Adam came out of the side of the last Adam, and when Jesus arose from the dead, hallelujah, he arose with victory because he is now not alone, but he has a companion called the church. And he paid the price. It's the only thing that Jesus ever purchased. This is why the Father honors the church today is because of what you and I were purchased by, and it was the blood of Jesus Christ, not by the blood of bulls and goats. We have not been rehabilitated. We've not been just counseled or changed, but we have been blood bought by the power power of the Holy Ghost. You and I are not who we used to be. We're not an addict. We're not an alcoholic. Hallelujah. We're not ruled by temper or cursing or porn. We're a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. We have been raised in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And he whom the Spirit has set free is free indeed. Don't you let the devil tell you that you're insignificant. Don't you let the devil tell you you can't do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You don't have to have a degree. You just need faith. Revelations of 21st chapter, two verses, two and nine, both talk about that the church is as a bride adorned for her husband. One verse says, behold, let me show you the bride who is the lamb's wife. So at Calvary, Jesus began the redemptive plan of God. But the church is going to finish it. The number one people group in the world, it's almost at genocide levels, is the persecution and the martyrdom of Christians. Why? Because the church is going to destroy the powers of darkness. Yeah. 
I thank God for my physical Bible. But that physical book in itself isn't my strength. Say, now that's blasphemy. And that's what I'm talking about. Go to China where they don't have Bibles. Or they might get just the book of Second Thessalonians. And they'll pass one page at a time around to every believer, hundreds of them, and each one of them will memorize the page, and they'll get another page. Where did their strength come from? Not holding the physical book. The reason I say that is because the devil thinks that if he can outlaw a Bible, then the church loses its power. Not so. Hallelujah. We have Christ in us. The Holy Ghost brings back to our remembrance the things that Jesus Christ speaks to us. You may be able to pass a law that I can't pray out loud, but it's like the little boy. I may be standing up on the outside, but or I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Just because my lips aren't moving doesn't mean that the Holy Ghost is not releasing a prayer of faith out of my spirit. I I thank God for our freedom today. I thank God that Jasmine can lead us in worship. But our strength goes a lot farther than a B3 Hammond and an electronic cord keyboard. It comes out of the depth of our soul. Why? Because we are the bride of Christ and the same anointing that's on Jesus is in our spirits. There is nothing in the earth that God is coming back for except the church. Nothing. Why? Why? Because the church is the only thing that's eternal. You know, all of the beautiful buildings in Europe, the churches and the magnificent structures throughout the earth that house some type of even pagan worship. If Jesus was willing to let Herod's temple that in our money system would be worth over $3 billion probably, be destroyed, then he's not going to be too concerned about the buildings that we build. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, we want a nice church. America has been raised privileged. We've been raised spoiled. You know, the same guy that'll sit for three hours in 20 degrees and watch a football game can't sit in a church service for an hour because the pew's too hard. The Spirit of the Lord has raised up the church in this hour. You know, the Jews have a synagogue. The Buddhists have a temple. The Muslims, the Muslims have a mosque. Only in Christianity are the believers the church. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus said not one stone would be left upon another because he doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. This is why there is such a persecution and such a Uh, a a regiment that's coming against the church in this hour is because hell knows that it is the church in the United States of America that's going to turn, turn things around by the power of the Holy Ghost. And instead of us getting away with services, we're going to continue to increase them by the power of the Lord. You cannot shut the church up. We are not going away. 
think, well, we'll just arrest you and stick you in prison. How'd that work out in Paul and Silas's time? God showed up, shook the very foundations of the building, opened every door, and loosed Holy Ghost revival in the middle of it. I'm telling you that the church is getting ready as the bride of Christ to rise up in the earth, and God is going to move through us by the power of the Holy Ghost. We represent Jesus Christ. When we speak hallelujah, we are speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus Almighty. There is no devil that should intimidate you. There are no powers that are greater than you. The church, the church, the church is the apple of our eye. The church is the light of the world, and we are the salt of the earth. And I can promise you the powers that be in the earth, if you could listen to their strategy meetings, you would hear them say one thing, we've got a deal for Christianity in the church because it empowers people, and we can't control them. Now, um, in fact, in our conference, our spring conference, um, you're really going to want to come here, Tiff Shuttlesworth, because he has a marvelous message I've asked him to preach. But, you know, there's so much trepidation in this hour, and there are so much speculation about, you know, is it the mark of the beast? And um, I really don't worry about any of that. I figure if we just stay Holy Ghost filled, keep our prayer life right, because Paul said for me to die is gain, and so how many saw the Wednesday podcast? How many feel that way? Amen. I I mean, we're blessed. Uh, I'm probably more blessed at almost 68 years old than I've ever been in my life. And yet I'm more dissatisfied and more hungry for God than I've ever been in my life. Because you, you just need the release of the presence of the Lord. And so <clears throat> there's a lot, of, a lot of people who say I'm a Christian, but they don't value the local church. I'm going to make a very bold statement here. Now, I understand, and I get a lot of emails about this, that there's lots of people that live in places they can't find a church. Not a good one. And I'm right there with you. If it's dead as a doornail, I ain't going. Because you, you leave mad and frustrated because you feel like I didn't go to church. But if you have access to a good church and you don't go to church, you ain't making it. You're going to wind up in hell. Say, now that's really tough. Forsake not the assemblies of thyself together. If God's no respecter of persons, what if everybody had that same philosophy, there would be no church. If everybody had the same philosophy that I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, then we would have no church. The church is not the Assembly of God movement. It's not their organization. The church is not the church of God. The church is not the Catholics. The church is not the Pentecostals. There are many members, but there's one body. And the concern that Jesus had at the end of his ministry, and he prayed this, he was concerned about the division in the body of Christ. We don't need to worry about the wars around us. We got so many wars going on inside the house of the Lord. You know, if you don't speak in tongues, I don't have a problem with that. But it doesn't mean that we have to draw swords and butcher each other. Because in eternity, it will all be bore out anyway. Whenever you decide, 
most organizations were started from revelation and then they stopped there and got a spirit of elitism that somehow we're better than everybody else and we don't fellowship with other groups because they don't know what we know. Listen, we don't know hardly anything. None of us. If God would begin to reveal to us the fullness, hallelujah, of who he is. Whenever you read about men coming into the divine revelation of God, Daniel said it made me sick. Isaiah said, I feel like I'm a sinner. I'm unclean. You have to be a part of the church. And Jesus said, a Father, I pray that they would be one even as you and I are one. And what we're having in this hour is the enemy's trying. Listen, the greatest danger in the body of Christ is not from without, it's from within. The greatest danger in a local church is not from without, it's from within. The greatest danger that Moses had was not the Philistines, but it was his own leaders out of the Levite tribe and his brother and sister who said, we're just like you. It doesn't matter about talent. Talent is what not what doesn't. It's who's called having the ability to speak and having the knowledge of the word doesn't make you a preacher it has to be a divine call from God that comes on your life it has to be a divine call on the church and this church hallelujah has been blood bought by the power of the Holy Ghost and the enemy cannot kill us he cannot silence us he cannot vaccinate us he cannot shut us up why because we are the wife of Jesus Jesus Christ the church in the earth is the only thing that's eternal when the battle is totally over and Jesus is ruling from Jerusalem the church will be alive and well and all of these other men that have such a voice in the earth from Putin on will be silenced. Why? Because what we have, what we're attached to, the reason God will sustain the church is because we are the wife of his son. And no wonder the Lord is coming back with a shout because Jesus and his bride have been separated for 2,000 years physically. It must be an amazing thing. Jasmine and I have this, we talk about this, and um, there's, there's lots of different views on this. Some people believe that when a Christian dies, or even an unbeliever dies, that they're just asleep. And they're not aware of anything until uh, resurrection. And then my, my personal view is, I think that, Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I personally think the moment you take your lax breath, you're with Jesus. And I've thought about this. It must be an amazing thing. Uh, you know, Josh just crossed over. And, uh, you know, he said he didn't want to come back because he didn't want to leave the presence of the Lord. I, it, I have yet to hear of any believer that's ever had the choice that ever said, I want to come back. That was, that's how powerful the presence of the Lord is. Now, me and Carrie and, and my wife, we'd like to kick his butt all the way. We're going to be the first ones in heaven to do it because of his choice. But can you imagine what it's like every time a believer walks into the physical presence of Jesus and part of the bride comes home? Hallelujah. Part of the bride comes home. What we have right here is going to turn the tide. I don't know how, but I can tell you this. I believe, <clears throat> I feel this in my spirit, I believe that God's getting ready to release some things to the church that we've not had. 
you know, I've always wanted this. They say in Catherine Kuhlman's meetings uh, that <clears throat> you could hear a, a, a vibration, a roar in the building of the presence of God. And many, many people have said we have seen a mist or a smoke in the atmosphere with our physical eyes. We've had people write in, and we, I mean, we got it on camera, but uh, of angels being seen in the building. Um, I've never had any of that. But I can tell you that there is something breaking in the spirit right now. Karabobo Sunday. Hallelujah. And this whole thing, it's to shut the mouth of the church of the Most High. That's what it's after. So you hold your ground by the power of the Lord. Because I'm telling you, there is a divine intervention of the Holy Ghost getting ready to hit the earth. Because God hears the cries of people, hallelujah, in India. He hears the cries of people in Africa. He hears the cries. Somewhere the gospel of the Lord has to be released in that atmosphere by the power of the Lord. Now, while we have a 48-foot statue downtown Nashville in the Parthenon of Jezebel uh, that just mocks the presence of the Lord. Uh, if this is a God portal, then we could declare by the Spirit of the Lord uh, that God will topple that thing uh, just as he did the, the God Dagon uh, because Nashville belongs to the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, if you want to be strong in the Lord, uh, get a hold uh, of a church. Uh, sell out. Get involved. Uh, pray. Shake the nations. One of the reasons that I know that there is such a move of God in this church is, what was it, two Saturdays ago was our prayer meeting? We had hundreds of people in this building. I cannot tell you for me personally what a joy it was because I love prayer. And I thought, God, and I wanted prayer meetings where we just don't all stand there and somebody gets up and, Oh, Lord, we pray for this, and then somebody's real quiet, and they pray for that. I said, Lord, there's got to be people that can pray out loud, that just walk all over the building, praying in the Holy Ghost, and interceding in the Spirit of the Lord. We've got that in this church. Y'all are powerful in the Holy Ghost. That's why your children are going to get saved. Your 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 children are going to come back to God. Marriages are being restored by the power of the Lord. Poverty is being broken in the name of Jesus. That there is an open heaven over this region and in this city by the power of the Lord. Why? Because the church is alive and well. Not only in this nation, but in the earth because she is eternal by the power of the Lord. As I in, and all of us have struggled with this because, uh, Steve, you did such a great job on the offering, on that, uh, talking about the seed. But how many of you have tithed over the years and you know people that don't tithe and it seems like they just got so much? And you look at that and you think, man, I don't know if this works or not. And you... And David talks a lot about this in the Psalms, about how the wicked would prosper and, you know, even to the third and fourth generation and their barns are full and, you know, their cows don't give before time. And, and he said, I started to wonder, have I done this in vain? I mean, if you're breathing, you've had moments where you thought, does this work? You know, because you got that person in your family you don't really like and they got everything and they're mean as a snake and you think God you know here I am I'm praying I'm fasting I'm tithing you know I'm, I'm raising my children right and we're just struggling and David said Lord I think it's in Psalm 73 talks about this he said I couldn't understand it to the point that I begin to get confused. He said, until I went into the sanctuary. 
And then I understood. Sometimes you just got to get in the church for there to be an understanding. Because regardless of how you and I are in our walks of life and what we're going through, six, seven, eight years from now, it's very possible that the rapture will have taken place. And when you walk through the gate and Jesus is there and you see him for the first time and he looks at you and he goes, well done. Well done, faithful servant. And he just grabs you. And for the first time, you get to hug your father, your husband. And he says, you're home now. He'll reach over and wipe the tears away. He say, ain't no crying in heaven. And he's going to say, let me show you what I prepared for you. And you're going to see things that <clears throat> will be amazing. But until then, you and I have got to fight the fight. And we've got to finish the course. And we're going to do it as the church. So regardless of what you hear in the media, regardless of what laws are passed, I can promise you this, that the church has thrived in communism, paganism, humanism, secularism, every ism that's out there that the enemy has come up with. The church has survived every one of them. And today the church is alive and well and Stalin's dead, Hitler's dead, Lenin's dead, Mussolini's dead. Idi Amin is dead. Hallelujah. The rulers in Philippines are dead. It doesn't matter how many of them were great. They're all dead. But Jesus Christ is alive and well. And so what God wants you to get in your spirit is that you are part of something that is greater than you alone. That there are many members, but there's only one church. There's no Long Ranger church. There's no somebody, well, I just sit in my house and read my Bible and I love God. That's going to cost you your soul. Get your butt in church. Hallelujah. Get in the altar. Learn how to praise God and lift up the name of the Lord and watch what God will do with you. Today I loose your shout in the spirit. May God begin to touch your vision and your rise. May the Lord begin to tell you that there are great days ahead, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Stand with me. What you're a part of right now, see, we just see the worship and the music and Pastor Kemp preaching, but you have no idea what's being released in the atmosphere. Right now, our praise, our faith could be hitting somewhere in Australia. That strongholds are being shaken by the power of God. See, we don't have any answer in politics. I don't know of any Holy Ghost filled Supreme Court justices. I don't see him having Pentecostal church in the legislature. I see one law after another being passed that's against the principles of the Lord. But our hope, our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You give me 3,500 people in this building, pack it out. And you lose, hallelujah, the song of the Lord. 
You begin to lose. Hallelujah. You can't have my increase. Hallelujah. You can't have my family. Or we sing, uh, our God is an awesome God. Uh, I'm telling you that there's something more than in the natural taking place. There's something being loosed. Uh, you're firing arrows uh, in the spirit. Uh, they're coming after the strongholds uh, of hell that are being pulled down uh, by the power of God. Uh, I lose the anointing of this church right now uh, over the atmosphere of Nashville uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, I loose your faith. Uh, pull down deep. Call it unto the deep. I feel like there's something breaking uh, in the name of the Lord. Uh, get intense in the Lord. It's not the building. It's us. Uh, here in the next few months, we've decided we're going we're gonna to have a tent meeting. But I told him, I said, I, I need a tent that will seat about three or 4,000 people at least. And we need a big field. Um, I, think, I think one of them said, let's do it at Bonnaroo. Um, why not? Have healing lines like they did in the 50s. Holy Ghost, Pentecostal music, great preaching. If you've never been in a tent meeting, there's there's a new left, there's a different kind of freedom in a tent meeting. Hallelujah. There's something that begins to break loose in the Holy Ghost. And I, I felt like for the last two or three weeks that there's a blanket that the enemy has been trying to put on this house. And we're going to break this thing off today. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is your church. You are his wife. And I need some people today. Hallelujah. That will get a little bit free in the spirit of the Lord. And begin to lift up your voice. And begin to declare that we are married to Jesus. We're the body of Christ. That though he's gone, his body is in the earth. And we're going to shake things by the power of the Holy Ghost. So as Jasper starts to lead us in song, maybe we could just fill it up. But here's, I want you in your spirit mind to begin to do this. I want you to begin to pull down every stronghold. I want you to cancel every assignment that the enemy is bringing against us. Listen, great church is, doesn't mean just because it's a big offering. I'm thankful that you tithe. I'm thankful that you give powerful church is not how many people you have in the building it is what are you doing in the atmosphere do I have some praisers in this building do I have some warriors in this building hallelujah do I have some men and women that are not afraid to get a little bit bloody in the Holy Ghost get out your sling in the Holy Ghost I loose the spirit of David in this house today in the name of Jesus that every weapon is canceled pulling down the strongholds of hell
tell you what I what I'm seeing in the spirit is we've been having great church. I'm not discounting that. But I'm also in the spirit and some of you might sense this and some of you might not, but I'm telling you there's an attack of the enemy right now in the atmosphere <clears throat> that's trying to come against Regeneration Nashville to shut us up. It's, I'm not talking about legally or anything like that. I can just sense it in the spirit of the Lord. And the reason it is is because there is another breakthrough, says the Lord, that's getting ready to hit this house. And the enemy senses that by the spirit by the Spirit of the Lord, and He's trying to stop it. And so I'm asking you to make a commitment to the Lord that you hold your ground and that you're no longer defensive, but you get offensive in the Holy Ghost and you begin to come against this thing in the name of Jesus. Whatever you bind, He said, you, I'll bind it. Whatever you loose, I'll loose. I don't need that Christians eating baby milk. I need some warriors hallelujah and the Holy Ghost that got some meat in their teeth and look hell in the eye and say not this house, not this city not this state not this nation but we're taking you on in the name of the Lord. So this is how we fight our battles in the name of Jesus. Let your spirit go. Let your voice lift it up in the Holy Ghost. Break this thing. Break it, break it in the name of Jesus. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm I don't do this all the time, but I just felt prompt in spirit. This is Mike, right? And Mike is in the last stages of cirrhosis of the liver. And we're going to believe that today God's going to heal him. Um, this, is, this is the anointing that's in this house. We're seeing God heal cancer, Parkinson's, sugar diabetes, prostate cancer. So how many will join with me? in your faith this is nothing for Jesus hallelujah in fact the Lord has a bigger problem trying to deal with our doubt than he has dealing with cirrhosis of the liver so Mike in the name of Jesus hallelujah I command this demon spirit of cirrhosis of the liver to come out of your body in the name of the Lord right now hallelujah all over your body in a, a new liver a brand new liver in the name of Jesus hallelujah now in the name of the Lord hallelujah hallelujah 